Welcome back, Chris Temple here with you again. And as we continue our journey to the turn uh, toward the second half of 2024, uh, which is going to be interesting to say the least, politically and geopolitically and economically and market wise, and I'm sure all the rest, we're among other things wrapping up some updates with some of our featured opportunity companies. Uh, today's example is BioLargo. Uh, they are listed on the OTCQB under the symbol BLGO. And as I've described it before, and I don't like to always have the, exactly the same mindset for everything that we do, but I think it's a good corollary. Those of you who are familiar with uh, extractive industries, mining, exploration, or whatnot, and, and can be for energy and other things as well, are, are familiar with the term prospect generator. Uh, maybe in a broader business sense, we call these things business incubators. And these are companies that don't just have one story, but they might have multiple different stories, appendages and whatnot. And the idea is to bring one of, or more of these to fruition. Usually after having done all of the initial legwork, discoveries and whatnot, by bringing in a larger partner with some deep pockets to monetize their work. And in BioLargo's case, we we're seeing now additional examples on top of what they've already done. We're gonna have Dennis Calvert, who is a company CEO and president on here with me in just a second. But before I bring him on, uh, Dennis and or myself, of course, may be making forward-looking statements uh, of one fashion or another. So the securities regulators want you to be aware of that, uh, and which is just good form anyway, because uh, all the best laid plans sometimes don't work out quite when you want, exactly how you want, and so forth. Uh, this is part of your due diligence, of course, to learn more about BioLargo. You know, Dennis and I do the best we can to lay things out for you and then let you make your own determination as to whether this belongs in your portfolio or not. As I said, BioLargo has a number of moving parts. Uh, it is best known, even if the company itself is not recognized as this, but is best known by this character right here, who you've doubtless seen on one or more commercials and all different manner of media. Uh, this poof product, the pet uh, odor and stain remover, is an invention of one of BioLargo's several subsidiary companies. They, for a while now, have had an Asian partner that has spent the money and time to market this. They've done very, very well. And as you're going to be hearing from Dennis, this is the single biggest reason why their revenues quarter over quarter continue to go up significantly, as they just reported again last month for Q1 of 2024. Uh, now you're going to hear today in this update, and there's a pretty meaty one coming. And what you're going to hear about today is that their medical products company, their wound care products, and some of those related things, they just got a new partner to help monetize that technology as well. Uh, and, and not uh, any slouch, the PFAS story continues to get better and better. You're going to hear about that. Uh, the company also just got a couple of, and this interested me, this kind of came out of left field for my own consciousness. They just got two Air Force contracts that they announced uh, in the month of June to do some uh, engineering and uh, air remediation work for them. And last but not least, if you remember this part of the story, which is one of the newer parts of BioLargo's story, you're also going to hear from Dennis about how they have now produced their first prototype energy storage batteries, SANS Lithium. And here I am with Dennis Calvert, the CEO of BioLargo. Dennis, good to see you again, my friend. Yes, it's my pleasure. Good to be here. You know, I neglected before you came on to remind people of, it's hard to believe it's six months of this year has gone by already, but as we were getting ready to start this year, you and I did a really deep dive in all the different moving parts. That'll give people some great background. If you've not watched that, folks, yet, make sure you go to my YouTube channel. This is what you're looking for here on the screen. And uh, even aside from that and listening to Dennis and I today, make sure that you spend some time at BioLargo's website. There's several appendages to it as well that are going to give you all of the individual stories that we're going to recap today. Because again, this is one of the most cool, multifaceted, again, what do you want to call the prospect generator, business incubator, or whatever that you're going to find. Uh, it, it, it truly, truly is. And you've been 
quarter by quarter, Dennis, looking ever better. Marching and uh, marching as, along. Right yeah. On. As far as the quarterly statements are concerned, uh, you love cash flow. Cash flow is a game changer for Biolargo. Man, yeah. it's so nice. Yeah. So give us a so quick lap you. through. Uh, it was last month that you put out the uh, Q1 of 2024. Give us a quick lap through the high points of that. Yeah. So uh, the first is we had a hundred. So year before last annual, we had 102 or 3% growth. This year was about 108%. And the trending puts us with a record Q1. If we just do what we're doing, just, and we don't even have dramatic growth, we'll come in at around 19, 20 million bucks in revenue. So that's pretty good. And the thing is that the SGNA is still remaining relatively static. So we're watching marginal cash flow really kick in on on finding the channel for these innovations, especially poof, of course, which is just so dramatic. It's it's you can't you can't have a conversation without talking about poof. But the other assets are coming on too. I mean, really, you know, and they're significant. Um, and the thesis that we're putting forth for these innovations is also being widely accepted. That doesn't mean you know it's instant revenue like in some of our big big things like our battery tech, but it's so encouraging because you know I always say where we may not have been credible before. We are so now. And so why is that, right? Well, that's that's psychology, right? We have a winner. It's a big winner. People had, at some point had wondered whether anything was actually ever going to find its way to commerce. And now that it is, this, the financial performance is so dramatic, which, of course, is by design, right? And that's this well, is one and, of the things we talk and about. Poof, mm -hmm. and, and poof sales and your cut of that, your your own end of that yeah. for Biolargo, that has been pretty much doing all the heavy lifting or virtually all of it, revenue yeah. and cash flow wise. So that has come to some fruition already. Uh, yeah. Tell us about, give us an update as far as the market penetration and whether, you know, you've described, you've described from time to time in the past that the real payday may come later on with an actual sale yeah. of this product. Well, so the model, remember, yeah, it's for everybody who may not remember, we invented this product for odor control. It's awesome. We've been doing industrial work for eight years and slaving away. I mean, hard work, hard work, low margin, tough business. Holy cow. Uh, but winning, you know, and, and by the way, the industrial side is growing as well. It's not as dramatic, but still growing. But we became experts. So then this marketing group came along and said, hey, you know, we think that this is a billion dollar future product. And we said, we do, too. And they said, well, let's make a make a, an arrangement, a business deal. We said, well, if if we'll let you have the exclusive rights to sell this product as a pet odor control product uh, for in exchange for a deal in which we could be the supplier. So we maintain supply chain, cost plus margin, and then a little royalty, a royalty that's tolerable, not greedy, a little royalty. So nobody's pain, you know, suffering. Uh, and then in exchange for exclusivity, we get 20% of the equities. So, Because people always say, you know, how does a little company like ours change the world? Well, you do it with great partners. And there's a strategy. The strategy is innovate this world-class thing, find something that's high impact. And, we, you know, you don't do all the work. You do the hardest work. Hardest work. What's that? Getting market adoption. Oh, my gosh, is it hard? And it took us a long time, you know. And I always, you know, look, you know, I know I roundabout answer to your question. But, but they're <laughs> talking about. Uh, they've told us they want to target 80,000 retailers this year. So they're on their, on the way to do that. That last year, remember a year ago, we were talking about 25,000 retailers. So that's a big, big up. Uh, we've also introduced a handful of new products that are from our portfolio. You know, absorbent products like uh, puppy pads, a cat litter product that just incredibly soaks up moisture and makes cat litter not stink. Uh, it really does work. And they're introducing that as a brand called um, Under the Poof Umbrella. The literizer, the literizer, and it's the litter equalizer. Anyway, it's a great little clever, you know. I hadn't heard of that one yet. Yeah. So you're gonna, so you got the same kind of a formula that's gonna help to make cat litter smell like peaches and roses or something. Well, just not stink, and no <laughs> fragrance. See, that's the key. In fact, one in the somebody says it smells like nothing. Right, it smells like nothing. So it doesn't smell fragrant. Right, because because fragrance also have you know some connotation of maybe not so great either. Sure. Anyway. Not all of them. You know, there's some great products out there. We, we, we always want to be careful. There's some really good products. Ours is just unique in its ability to be so powerful as absorbent. And then, and as we say, eliminate the, the odor from its source. And why? Because it oxidizes. It breaks down the components. So if you get chemistry on the stuff that stinks, it's going to work. Right. So it's a, it's a winning product. Nice. And, of course, it's great science because it's safe, safe, safe.
Right. Do no so in harm. the so in the end, you're looking hopefully at some point for sales to hit the critical mass. Well, uh, they had said to us, yeah, you know, yeah. So the Poof team has always said we want to get it to 100 million. We think the company would be in play for an exit, and I think they're going to go much bigger. Okay. Now we don't know that for sure. Okay. It's a, it's a it's a theme that we believe is true because I think they're having so much success. And when you get so successful, it's like, well, we don't want to, we like it, you know? Yeah. And that's good for all of us, you know? That means is if they go to a couple hundred million, we generally run about 23 to 25% of their revenue. So if they're doing 100, we're doing 25. If they're doing 200, we're doing 50. If they're doing 500, we're doing 125. I mean, you got to just run the math here, okay? And the reason that's interesting is um, given, and of course we had a lot of value, you know, people say, you know, what do you do with that? I said, it's our invention. It's our invention. We can, we do work the supply chain aggressively to support them and we're innovators. So when they say we're thinking about, you know, we focus on product development to bring forth the next generation, the next generation and the next. So we're, we're, we're partnered in a nice intimate way and a, and a win-win and a win-win win for them too. Right. right. So, um, yeah, so I hope they go bigger, actually. That's the way I'd say it. I hope they go bigger. Uh, I'm sure you won't be complaining, and neither will the shareholders. So moving on, Dennis, the biggest part of the company, as I understood it when you and I first got acquainted, uh, and potentially the blockbuster long-term, of course, is your PFAS remediation technology. Uh, this is a story that has been in the national press, the global press. It's a multi-trillion dollar market potentially to remove these so-called forever chemicals from water. You've got the cat's meow by all appearances that that's going to be the next generation mm -hmm. of this. And I want you to talk about two things, if you would. First of all, you announced your first commercial contract uh, around the holidays at the end of last year with a municipality in New Jersey uh, and their water uh, uh, entity there. Uh, so tell yep. us where that is at. And secondly, you've added some news recently that is exactly what you predicted months and months ago, not over a year ago, and that is yeah. that regulations and and those changes are actually going to pull people in your direction. So give us give us a look at that. Yeah, exactly right. So uh, our our first commercial account is Lake Stockholm, New Jersey. It's a small uh, system, but that's great. I mean, so think about it's it's engineers, so they want to start small and get, go big. And because you want to control as much as you can and make sure it's it's as perfect as possible. And so that's scheduled to go in the field in September, October, which is awesome. And it is a commercial account. You know, we'll, we're getting paid for that. And that's important. I, and to our knowledge, so we're not we're not certain, per, certain, perfectly certain, but to our knowledge, we're actually the only alternative emerging tech that's got a commercial install. I mean, that's really pretty amazing. And, and people forget, you know, we've talked about the difficulty in innovating in the water industry, especially drinking water. It's the most difficult. And people can spend years and years and years, okay? So the idea that we kind of skipped over some of this early stage commercial piloting to go commercial is really a testament to the engineers and also the, the simplicity of our solution. When you look at it, you say, hey, that'll work. You know, nobody says, oh, I don't get it. You're like, oh, no, that's really smart and, as, and simple. You know, and remember, we use an electrostatic field, we migrate the PFAS and collect it like flypaper on a membrane. That's pretty simple. Now, the reality of the art is there's a lot going on, okay? Temperature, uh, speed, uh, energy, lifespan, cleaning. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot that goes on to actually make that commercially viable. And then scale, you know, how do you do it big? You know, add up panels and how much are the panels? Like, can you produce in mass? All that stuff is happening real time. The, the point is it does work. We've done about, I think, 13 trials, and consistently we've proven not to tech. Remember, the goal here is to get to four parts per trillion or lower on the removal of PFAS, which is like a couple of grains of sand in a swimming pool. I mean, it's just, it's this infinitesimal small uh, component of contaminant. These are forever chemicals. Forever chemicals means they stick around in nature forever. Nature can't degrade them. Linked to birth defects and cancer. Watch the movie Dark Waters. Okay, that's the pitch for the whole scheme of the industry. But some people really estimate this to be globally over the lifespan, a $17 trillion market. I mean, this is, the, and you know, it's not going to go away overnight. And yes, regulatory is pushing people towards us. And remember our thesis when we started, 
one of our lead engineers who's been doing environmental remediation for 30 years. These are not rookies. These are pros at Biolargo. Before Biolargo, okay, they've been doing this thing, okay? And Randy, Randy Moore looked me in the eye. He said, uh, you know, the world was calling for destruction, destruction. He said, whatever you do, don't do that. I said, why not? He said, because here's what's going to happen. It's going to go hazmat. And when it goes hazmat, destruction is going to be extraordinarily complicated for compliance with hazmat regs on handling and disposal and destruction. And it, it's like the world came out early with this dreamy version of what could be for a technology innovation. But this, you know, the, the laws of conservation of matter took over. You can't neither destroy, or, right, make or create or destroy matter. Meaning there's a waste stream. You've got to manage the waste. So the thesis for our innovation is be the most excellent collector. Be the most excellent collector. And we believe we are the most excellent collector. When you, when you concentrate a contaminant, super concentrate, you can do whatever you want. Instead of managing a truckload of waste, like 80,000 pounds, we generate two pounds. Yeah, I mean, that's forty thousand. Yeah, and as you've explained this before, and and people really need to get this, and this is why you're an emerging technology that's improving upon this. That's the first one, as far as you know, with a commercial contract, because it, people are familiar, and maybe they've had them in their home. I've had them in my home. You know, the sure. old you can buy them for a few bucks at the store, the activated carbon type of thing. Well, imagine that on a huge scale, collecting all this PFAS. Now the government just said that now that's a hazardous material. The, the carbon that you just trapped all the hazardous materials in, now it's a hazardous material. And you've got a exactly. Fraction, yeah, you've got a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the footprint of that, which alone uh, is, I think, going to have pretty amazing path to your door. Yeah. So, we're, so what we've been doing now with that thesis is modeling. Right, the modeling of what does that mean economically? Because you got it. Because there's lots of variables, and it's hard to just have a cookie cutter model. But you try to get there, and so that when you sit in front of a prospective account, you can say, "Look, here's what disposal is going to look like. Here's what hazmat handling is going to look like. Here's what the waste stream is for this carbon system or this ion exchange. Here's the resin that's going to accumulate on your resin, and what are you going to do with it? And here's your choices. And we walk through the choices. Here's the cost of this one. Here's the cost of that one. Here's the cost. Of that. And then by the time you have all this up. It, assuming that hazmat rules do kick in, which of course they are. And so there's two, CERCLA, uh, which basically designated all these uh, contaminated sites as Superfund sites, which means now that there's litigation potential for the polluter and the polluter will pay, okay? And so DuPont and 3M have uh, issued settlements at over 12 billion. The government just set aside a $10 billion fund plus another 1.5 billion, okay? Just hear this, 1.5 billion for... Um, underserved communities. Okay, so because people say, well, how are they going to pay for it? And then ultimately, they're going to pass it along to the ratepayer. right? This is drinking water. Okay, so so what happens then in the cycle of, of taking this to market, what you're really trying to overcome is fear. Okay, and that is the problem with innovation, fear. I don't want to adopt too early. I don't want you to fail. I can't be embarrassed. I'm accountable to my constituents. It's real. People, I'm telling you, it's real. Um, and, it, and it's hard to overcome. And so how do you do that? Well, you, you you plug away. You get people to pull you in. You do little, you do bigger, you do bigger and you do bigger. And then one day it says, gosh, it really works. I'm like, dude, I knew it worked four years ago. But but that's what happens. Okay, so this is a hard thing we're doing. And, and I, I really want to say that because it just takes so long and so much work. Well, but you're here's dealing with government or quasi-government entities, and they don't move all that fast to begin with. Well, and here's the beauty, and this is what I, exactly right. This is what I want to point out. The beauty in our uh, system and our in our company is that when when we enter a market with a new innovation, the thesis goes like this: start with the highest purpose use and hopefully highest margin. Hard to do both. If you can, your chances of adoption are greater. Okay. When we enter, we say do that, but also position yourself for all the all the tangent markets. And so notice in our testing, we've been testing all kinds of stuff, groundwater, drinking water, uh, leachate water, that's water that comes out of the landfill, firefighting foam water, industrial wastewater. I mean, we go on and on. And why is this important? Because when as the regulatory noose tightens, those other markets start adopting. Yeah. Okay? And so, so what's probably going to happen, actually, is we're going to win in water, drinking water, because it's real. 
Remember, we had these these wonderful public servants have joined our board. Top researcher from the EPA, Sally Gutierrez, and yeah. Jeff Keitlinger, executive director of Metropolitan Water District, the largest seller of drinking water in the world. Did you hear that? Right. And then Larry Larry Dick is this Orange County, you know, just this so connected and so such an influencer because of his passion to deliver clean water, really. And so these people come on board, not, you know, you can't pay them enough, number one. They do it for a purpose. They do it because they look at us and say, you're actually going to change the world for good. And I'm like, well, that's our whole business motto, right? So they said, well, we're going to help you do that. Get you through the cycle of adoption. That's what they're saying. You got to get through the cycle. Okay, so what's going to likely happen is we will win in drinking water, but we're going to see much more rapid adoption in some of these other markets. And we're so well positioned for that. So, so we're very encouraged. And, and leachate is one of the next ones. That's the water that comes out of the bottom of the landfill. So why is that important, right? Well, number one, it's a highly concentrated waste stream. And so that's a technique for separating the PFAS, isolating the PFAS, allowing the balance to be not hazmat, go to the waste, to the traditional waste handling system in the, in the government, and then, you know, concentrate, destroy the PFAS. Awesome. We could do that. But we've been selling that industry for 10 years. Oh, oh, I thought you were an odor company. <laughs> no, we're an environmental solutions company. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. And so and what people don't realize is, and, and that is, by the way, you have to overcome it. Because in, in the eyes of the waste handling industry, if you talked about our business, they say, oh, yeah, that's that odor company. I'm like, man, we're so much more than an odor company. So, again, right. a little marketing is required. You got to plug away. And then strategically, um, people look at it and they say, as slow as it is to adopt, that also becomes a barrier for the next guy. And we're so good at the technology piece and serving the customer in the field. Um, that we're setting it up for mass adoption through channel partners. And so we have contract manufacturers. And so if somebody comes and says, I need a hundred tomorrow, turnkey outsource manufacturing. We don't have to do that. Now we can build it if we want, but we don't build it until we've got the channel established. Right. Right. That's the thesis of our company. You know, same thing with batteries. We'll get to that. So we say, what the heck? How can you be in the battery business? I'm like, look, by the time I'm making batteries, we're going to have so many orders. You won't even know what hit us. That's the key to the really the whole business model. And then, of course, the medical stuff is doing awesome, too. So, yeah, well, we're going to get to the batteries and the medical stuff. We're going to wrap up with that. But in between, you've put out sure. two different announcements in this month, just just in recent days, that you got Air Force contracts to deal with yeah. air quality issues, which I found remarkable. Uh, we hadn't talked about that a great deal before. So tell us what, which subsidiary is that? And what are you doing for them? Well, that actually goes to the engineering group. So that's direct okay. engineering services. All right. And so th remember this, this, our team uh, hails from a global multinational team of innovation and they've been doing a career work for 25, 30 years. These are, these are, we've got five or six senior veteran plus the team and there's a whole team of people. Um, so when we first did the business deal and brought this team in their, their mandate was three things, support old innovation, support customers, generating revenue, and then support new innovation. Okay, so the engineers actually do three jobs in one. And so this is make money with customers. That's the air quality. And so, and we're eminently qualified. And so we we started out with a few bases and they were smaller contracts, not financially really significant, but we did it and we did it really well. And so guess what? We just, we just upgraded, you know, 10X on the revenue profile. And so that's those are contracts that'll generate eight eight hundred to a million a year. Uh, they'll run for five years, and it's about a hundred thousand dollars a month or so in revenue. One point two million then for all of them, uh, approximately. And and of course they're not guaranteed for the life. The way those work is you get selected because you're good. They trust you, and then assuming you don't mess it up, you'll be there for the next five years. That's that's basically how it works. And and of course you got to do your job, which we do quite well at. But the key financially is it means that that operating unit, which historically has been primarily a service unit to all the innovation units in the company, is actually making money. Oh, you mean I've got a team of people that support everybody else and make money? That's the, that's the, that's right. That's the tribute to the business model. It also tells you, if you just really peel the onion, it tells you the demands it puts on our people. Our people work really hard. I mean, they are so busy. I can't even. And so, so you know, it's sustainable because they love it. We're doing this great innovation. Everybody wants to be successful. 
And then gradually over time, you increase your 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 staff because you can't kill them forever. It's all all that's happening at the same time. It's a great way to grow a business. And then having a five year, four to five year contract with consistent revenue allows you to plan and train and leverage infrastructure in a way that by large has not really been able to do. And now guess what? We could do it. Nice. So that, that's that's what that's about. That's super. I love to see that. Well, let's talk about the battery now because uh, it's been hot and heavy in the news for a while now. The you know there's been a debacle in the lithium sector. Uh, it's not going to go away. There's still a lot of good companies out there. But uh, and I've talked about this in other contexts in recent days, Dennis. But dang, I mean, uh, you, you've had huge moonshots in the price of various lithium inputs for batteries, and then price crashes. Uh, between and tariff, and policy, Big tariff too. Yeah. yeah, and and people wondering now what what the future of the EV industry is going to be. I think a lot of the fears are overdone. It's not going to go away, but it's going to evolve. As a lot of things evolve when they happen. But even before all of that started, one of the things that you pointed out to me uh, quite a while back was that it's a lot better proposition potentially for cost, for safety, and other reasons to have a sodium-based battery. Right. You right. guys bought the rights to technology for that, and you just announced that you've produced actually your Making first batteries. prototypes. And these yep. are not going to go into a Tesla or a Prius or anything like that. You're looking at a, a market that has not been discussed nearly enough among a lot of the green types, and that is the energy storage market. Right. Uh, which is big a whole big kettle of fish and a big one all by itself. So tell us about what got you to the, the this first production and what the plans are after that. Yeah, I'm really excited about this uh, opportunity for the company and for our stakeholders. Uh, it, and it's, it, it is also a big, you know, it's a big vision. So when I look, we took a heart deep dive, okay? And we spent about a year and a half, almost two years, bought the technology one of the co-founders joined our team. So we got one of the builders. They'd spent, the team before us, it's been eight years through R&D. Eight years, okay, to develop this commercially viable design. And we also struggled with what to call it because it's got statistics that don't match what the world has seen before. And so it's like, well, what do you call it? Well, it's a liquid salt. It's a sodium. It's a, you know, sodium sulfur. I mean, we had all these names. And what we discovered, of course, is each name had a connotation to overcome. And so, so we call it liquid salt. Well, and then, then Randy calls me, he said, you know, liquid salts are used in nuclear energy. I'm like, oh, geez, here we go. <laughs> you know? So, so we're still coining the words to describe it, right. but here's the punchline. It's a, it runs at a higher temp. So it's about 160 C, but let me just point out uh, 160 C compared to sodium sulfur that runs at 350 to 500 C. Hmm. We're a lot lower than that. And 100, 160 C is manageable in an enclosure that allows you to insulate. Um, and it does have some sodium and some sulfur in it. It's also got other chlorides and that's a recipe that we're not disclosing. And then it also has a ceramic component, which is really a critical piece of artful manufacturing. And I, and I mentioned that because what we what you discover as we go through this journey is the key is to be able to scale the manufacturing on the supply chain, the supply chain. And, and the better you can consolidate that or control it, then you can reach economy of scale in mass producing batteries. And so we really took a hard focus there. The other thing is we looked at the other people in the battery business and said, you gotta have a better battery, no fire risk. You know, these, these batteries go from zero to 100%, 100% to zero, no degradation. They last at least 10 years. We think it's a 20 year battery. We're still proving that. Strong energy density, we're 2.9 times the energy density of lithium. Um, Nice voltage, good power for the punch that's coming out of that battery. Easy to charge, easy to discharge. All of those feature in this in this design. And and then most importantly, no rare earth, no lithium, no cobalt, no nickel. Now we just, I mean, we just covered a whole menu. There's a lot. What's the punchline? It's a better battery. It's a better battery. It's a better battery. Now, better battery for fixed site. Uh, and think about it. Maybe it's partly it's just because it runs at higher temp. You don't want those in your car. You know, you want to have those fixed and insulated and safe. You don't want to move them around a lot. You want to put them somewhere and have them do their work. Well, what's that perfect for? Uh, offloading renewable energy like solar? That, that works. How about balancing the grid? Uh, yep, that's a big one. How about backing up uh, AI 
and Bitcoin mining and data centers. They're they're energy hogs, oh, and they need renewable exactly. energy. And okay, and then and then fundamentally, it enables the production of what's called microgrid. So a microgrid, basically, you know, in a businessman's easy words, a source of power, a source of storage, and a source of delivery. Yeah. Okay, localized. That's a microgrid. Well, the world's going to head towards microgrids because the the big grid can't handle the volume. Right. And it's 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 like ten percent of what it needs to be. And so people worry, you know. And I had somebody say to me one time, you know, I'm in I'm in Southern California. When Newport Beach goes dark for three days, people are going to get it. I'm like, oh wait, wait. <laughs> I'm not predicting that, by the way. But the point is, the overload that goes on the grid, okay, and it's happening all around the world. Okay, so then we said, okay, what are we going to do with this? How do we? How does our small company become a global impact player? How do we do that? And and we really kind of turned it, the industry on its head, and we said, you know, what we should do is focus on our core competency, which is what engineering, science, getting through the channel, constructing, building, right, and then partnering okay so how do you partner a battery so we went and test marketed and we said to the marketplace we're not selling batteries we're selling battery factories you know, think about that we're not selling batteries we're selling battery factories yeah so the idea is that we can come into a community well and offer them something of extraordinary value what's that we're going to put them in the battery business put them in the battery business how do you do that well i can build you a factory we can do the engineering we can supervise, we can install all the equipment, we can train, we can turn over, provision, right? Provision, turnover. And in exchange, what we'd like is a small piece of the equity of that venture, small piece, and a royalty. Okay. We want to be the supplier. We don't want to be the owner. Okay. Well, why would somebody do that? Well, uh, let me give you a list, okay? You ready? Uh, they'll hire, they'll employ a thousand people. That's a pretty good start. Uh, it could probably do a half a billion a year in revenue. That's a good business. Uh, they can get tax credits like uh, Inflation Reduction Act, 30% tax credits for the deployment in the field. They can supply grid-scale storage. They can build microgrids. They can do workforce development for employees. They can take depreciation. So what we're presenting is an economic development hub that becomes all these things that's empowered with a better battery. Nice. That's what we're doing. Now, it's amazing. I've never seen anything like it. So, so you've so, got the prototype you know, he, built. Yep. And and now you're doing what? You're you're displaying this to different people, showing them the performance of it and whatnot? Well, there's a series of things that we do. Okay. So there's actually a timeline. We publish it. Uh, so we're at the make and test battery stage and the early discussions of partnerships. Okay. And before you get to the final partnerships – you're going to have to have third-party verification of this battery tech. Right now, it's all internal. It's real, but that's not going to suffice. You need third party to say it's real. You also need to test the sales. We're also scaling up the sales. So we got a sale that's a, a you know, it spits in your palm of your hand. By the time it goes commercial, that sale will be about three inches by 13 inches. That's a 10x up, up scale. And then you take those sales, you put them in racks, and then you put racks in packs, and then you put packs in modules. That's yep. how it works. And if you want a big battery, you end up with a 20-foot trailer that'll, you know, run a hospital for a day, whatever. Whatever you want. You can make whatever you want. And that's the thesis. What you can say to a partner is, how many do you want? We'll build you a factory to suit. Let's do it. How many do you need? And, and we also have micro, micro factories. Now, in part of that, we think our supply chain for components is really critical. So, so listen, this is a massive vision. It's a massive vision. And, and so you say, is, is it too ambitious? I mean, let's just, right, let's cut to the chase. Is it too ambitious? Well, I think it's such a powerful idea to put people in the business and then empower them to capture all those goodies that people will roll out the red carpet for us all over the world. And that's what's happening. I mean, they come to us and they say, would you please come to my country and put a battery factory? And I says, well... We don't, we'll build you one. I'm not going to come over there and spend three years spending money, hope it works. We're not going to do that. But we'll empower you to own it and operate it and run it. And we can supervise and coach and teach. And that gives us unlimited scalability. I mean, right. you know, somebody says, how many could you do? And I'll tell you, I have a I have a great relationship. And over a long span of time, I asked the CEO, I said, how many factories have you built? 
He said, what do you mean? Like over, over 50 years. I said, how many factories over 50 years? He said, 900. Okay, so when we step up and say we can do 20, why couldn't we do 50? Remember, we're, we're leveraging the tools of the people to get the goodies, right? And so we're a facilitator of empowerment. If you want to change the way energy is delivered in America, we're your huckleberry. This is, this is the kind of plan that can transform the nation. And, well, and you I'll know why? Yeah, I mean, then as people who are following the whole issue, as I have done, and I know you have done, about how we're all worldwide going to meet our insatiable and growing needs for electricity down the road, these microgrids are becoming a very, very, very big topic. It's going to be some places with solar power, some places with a small modular reactor using nuclear power as a source. But every single one of them, whether you use that or you dry manure, I don't care what you're doing, you've got to have the batteries for storage and they've got to be reliable and they've got to be cost effective and the raw materials have to be plentiful. And that's another advantage of this battery. And so here's, you know, again, this is subtle, you know, the way I would characterize it, it's we're not in a, what we perceive as a high technology risk area. This is an execution risk area, all right? How do you do all this at once? And, and can you do it well? And then the other, the other is uh, when you look at like the art of its manufacturer of its components, it's not rocket science. Now it is an area that's precision. Okay, when you're assembling, you know, a, a, a battery cell that's going to operate 160 C, it has to be properly sealed. It has to be properly insulated. It has to be properly configured to be efficient. And so that's precision engineering. This is not, you know, guy in the shed throwing batteries together. Okay, and so then that becomes automation. So, so don't miss the fact that we recognize those are the things that have to be precise to be successful to scale in a massive way. But I would also argue at the same breath, well, that's who we are. That's who we are. We've demonstrated it now for almost 20 years, 16 years and going of the talent capable of pulling that off in a way that most people can't even dream about. Well, we got it. We got it in-house. Okay. And that really gives us a powerful edge. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. Um, a lot of work to do. I'm sure. And I'll be anxiously watching. But, you know, we, we want to wrap up with what is one of your more yeah. recent announcements on a 12th for Clara. And yeah. it's something that a lot of people might look past because the seemingly sexier stories lately have been PFAS and have been the batteries. But this is another thing that could be a nice big bread and butter, big money maker for you just like poof has been now that you have a partner it's... for you know products manufacturing that sitting on for a while looking yep. for the right manufacturing partner and you just announced that you've got them so how did that deal come about well we've been talking about a year and it did take at least a year and we're we're coming in on what we would call the preparation for the for the launch and it's taken a long time and so a critic and which i'm happy to talk about the critic would say what took so long and I like, oh, you have no idea. I mean, it's just incredible amount of work. A tribute to the team at the company, Clearer. And and they're, they're remarkable. And so a small company rise, raising up its bar to perform at the highest level. That's what's happening. And so then we have a distribution partner uh, that wants to take a product to, two products to market. And we say, hallelujah, let's go. Uh, and then in order to do that, we had to demonstrate the ability to produce to an FDA spec with all FDA compliance a product that's going to be used and sold through the channel of our distribution partner at very large scale, very, very, very large scale, bigger than people get their heads around. And so I say, okay, let's do it. And so we've been investing and we've been going through the process of preparing product for acceptance for a national rollout. That's, that's really the meat of our work. And so this Keystone Industries partnership is really nice. Privately held company, significant operation, 100 year history, we like them very much as people. They're highly skilled. They come beside you and they say, I can show you how to do this so the million units a year plus. And I think I think they could their current operation could even scale to like two almost four million units a year. It's big business. This is big business. Okay. So then in order to do that, they have to build out a line. The line is a significant investment on their part, probably three or four times what we put, we've committed to 1.4 million total investment. And it did inch up as we went. 
So, oh, it's a million. It's 800. Oh, it's going to be a million too. Oh, it's going to be a million more. And so the beauty is that because of the success of our business and, of course, the uh, opportunity that's so significant, we've been able to do that. I mean, most companies can't even pull that off. You know, so we do. We set, and, and again, we're, it, we're commercially available, but not in production. And we're not selling aggressively because we're really focused on this big launch. Anyway, we're coming in on the point where we think we've checked all the boxes and everybody says, OK, we, are we really ready? And it is. And let me just say it's a gut check. It's a gut check moment for the company because you just can't screw it up. You can't screw it up. The opportunity is so big and we need to be able to perform at the highest level. So if somebody says, hey, it's going to take another month, you know what we say? No problem. No problem. Whatever it takes to make it just right. So that when we push that, when we say go, it goes like a freight train. Okay. And that's that's really what we're doing. So yeah. And it, and and again, very similar in the thinking of the business model to like what we do with Pooh. Supply chain, partner up, give up a territory, like what they call a field of use in the contract language. Give up a field of use, make a partnership with it. We wholesale it. They retail it. They distribute. You co-brand and you do it with a big old juggernaut partner who's a pro, who's the one of the best in the world. Okay. And again, that goes back to that partnership model, the good and the bad. The good is when you get it right, oh my gosh, is it awesome. The bad is it's hard to get it right. It's hard. It's a very difficult, you know, it's easy to say, but you got to pick the right company. Then you got to, you got to do your part. You got to show up. So that's what's been going on. And that's, you know, we've, we've been total invested capital in, in clear is about 16 million, 17 million now and generated such nominal sales. So in the world of an average onlooker, they say, oh, well, that's a failure. And I'm like, no, oh, no, 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 no. We haven't wasted a penny. What we've done is we've set our sights on a billion-dollar prize. Don't miss it. It's a billion-dollar prize. Yeah. And, we're, and we are determined to make impact of that caliber with the right partners and make it a global product. And, and, and just like we did with Pooh. Just like we did with it's, it's the same idea. And, and again, it is, I always say, you know, is. You know, are we doing it well? Are we doing it right? Listen, if you can actually look back and make an impact of that kind of or, mag, order, order of magnitude and make money, that's worth a career. So that's what we're doing. Yeah, that's a good sure. one. Neat. So in, a, in the best scenario, uh, or I think that's a, a reasonable scenario, uh, when do you think you would start to see revenues from Clear and, and the wound care products and whatnot? Well, if we can finish up, yeah, if we can finish up that checklist, any you know, forthwith, which I think we're we're honing in on, you're probably looking at first orders. Hopefully, this year, there'll be a substantive. They'll get delivered. The revenue recognition happens when they're delivered. So remember that you also got a big order volume, and so the goal is to try and get them into the market in Q1, uh, 2025. So that's the goal. Um, and I've said it. If somebody says, "Hey, you know, we're going to delay a quarter," you know what I say? Uh, let's just make sure we don't screw it up. Yeah, we want. Well, it, of you... course, we want it tomorrow. Sure. I mean, right? We, of course, we do. But but well, here's the thing. Um, and and I think we're on track for that sort of timing. Uh, but, you know, we've been wrong before, too. I just want to give everybody realistic. This is one that all of a sudden happens. You go, oh, dear Lord, I missed it. <laughs> so so hang on. Let us get the work done. And then let's yeah. go out and do good. Okay. You know, I, I love that, Dennis, because you've got all these different moving parts. You're diligent. You, you can be excited, but diligent and realistic at the same time. Realize that the work that needs to be done to make things work properly uh, but folks, they've now demonstrated that in spades with poof. There's probably more upside there, like Dennis said earlier. You've got the PFAS unit that that that's where you could see some really barn burning activity down the road. Is is uh, you know a lot of these municipalities aren't going to be able to wait a whole lot longer, and others that that have you know industries and whatnot that need to remediate this issue. They're being shut out incrementally of what their solutions have been to date and that leaves you <laughs> uh standing in well front. yeah in fact that's cool i'll just point out in the carbon and ion exchange which is what was which is the most highly recommended tool okay and that's that's old technology yeah old technology it falls short in two ways when it, it has a very difficult time with short chain and ultra short chain molecules ultra shorts are just going to fly right through it they won't get them yeah. that means for many of the contaminates, it won't even work. Mm -hmm. 
for others, they have an issue what's called breakthrough. And breakthrough is it works, it works, it works, and it doesn't work. Okay. And so how do you predict breakthrough? How do you predict breakthrough in the carbon system? Uh, you look at historical data. They do, they do these long research cycles, and then you hope you get it right. Well, that's a problem. Hmm. And then you got 40,000 times the waste, 40,000 times, and it's a hazmat. And so we've said, it's a little bit, of, it's a, you know, it's a hypothesis, okay? It's our opinion. This is opinion. We think the price of hazmat management is going to go up 10x. Yeah. Now, somebody says, oh, you know, what do you know? And I'm like, we, have, we didn't just fall off the truck over here. Our no. guys have been doing this for 30 years. I'm telling you, 10x. And so when you look at your pro forma costs on these alternative old legacy technologies, you better put zeros behind it. And, and, and that's going to come. And it's going to be a mess. Yeah. And then there's going to be a whole nother outcry. We're lobbying, we're lobbying our Congress people. We're lobbying with the Senate. We're lobbying with the Department of Defense. Our technology begs for access to demonstration funding from the public sector to save the United States literally billions of dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Tell your congressman. Yeah. I'm look, <laughs> tell well, your water tell you, district. You know what? Yeah. Everywhere you look, environmental remediation, cleaning up this standard, the other thing is a hot topic. It's only going to get bigger, like you said, as time goes on and, and you're positioned right for it. So, Dennis, I appreciate the chance to catch up today. I, I, I love this story, folks. I love the company. Make sure, here it is again on the screen, that you spend some time at their website, follow them on social media, et cetera, as well as yours truly, where we have updates from time to time on the company. Uh, we're going to have a nice snazzy written profile on them coming up imminently as well on our story stocks issue. So make sure that you keep your eyes peeled for that. If you're not on my list for it already, make sure you get there. Uh, and this is one of the nice things I like about this, folks, is that even if you believe that we're in for some rocky times economically, financially, whatever, these technologies still move forward. The need for these technologies doesn't go away. These are not, you know, we're not talking here by and large about discretionary things. If you think we're going to go into recession, yeah, I wouldn't want to own a company selling washers and dryers when people are going to be trying to get as much life as they can out of the current ones. This is stuff that there's a continued need for and a growing need right. for. So I, I like it that you're in the right place. I love what you've done to date and, and the best of luck and good fortune going forward, yeah. Dennis. Yeah, thank you so much. And again, take a deep dive and and uh, you know, look back a year, you'll see more assets coming to bear. I mean, we're, we're right. innovating every day. So it's very exciting. That's right. Thank you so much. For much more of the National Investor's cutting-edge content and actionable investment opportunities, make sure to subscribe to Chris's free content at nationalinvestor.com. And don't forget to like this video and subscribe to this channel too. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.